Malcolm X, born Malcolm Little, was a Muslim minister and activist and a prominent figure in the civil rights movement. Today, we're going to talk about how his life and the string of tragedies, discrimination, and obstacles ultimately contributed into the powerful orator and the activist that he turned out to be. And if you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemikehistory.com. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on Buy Me Coffee, Patreon page, in the description below. Give us five stars on our podcast. But without further ado, let's get started. Being the fourth of eight children, Malcolm Little was born into a highly political family. His parents, Earl and Louise Little, were very supportive members of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, led by black nationalist leader Marcus Garvey. Earl was an outspoken advocate of civil rights, and often this led to white supremacist groups such as Ku Klux Klan subjugating Little's family to continuous harassment, which influenced Malcolm's early views on racial equality. In 1926, Earl Lewis Universal Negro Improvement Association activities were said to be spreading trouble. When Malcolm was only four, the family was driven out of Omaha, Nebraska by violent threats from white supremacist groups. They eventually settled in Lansing, Michigan. Unfortunately, the racism that they faced in Lansing was even more intense. The family was frequently harassed by a group called the Black Legion, which was another white supremacist group that culminated in their house being set on fire. But this was simply the beginning of the Little's family's struggles. In 1931, Earl Little was found dead, allegedly after being run over by a streetcar, which was widely suspected to be another act of white supremacist violence. Malcolm's mother, Louise, believed that Earl had been murdered by the Black Legion and subsequent grief and financial difficulties led Malcolm's mother to be committed to the Kalamazoo State Mental Institution in 1937, forcing his siblings to be separated and sent to various foster homes. In 1938, Malcolm was expelled from West Junior High School and sent to a detention home in Mason, Michigan. He states that the white couple that ran the institution treated him fairly, but he felt more like a pet than a human being. Later, despite being one of the few black students at Mason High School, Malcolm would excel academically. He was well liked by his classmates and they even elected him class president. However, in 1939, he had a turning point when his English teacher discouraged his aspirations of becoming a lawyer, stating that it was not a realistic goal for a nigga. Frustrated by this dismissal, old Malcolm dropped out of high school at 15. Later, he would recall feeling that the white world offered no place for a career-oriented black man, regardless of how much talent he had. Soon after, he moved to live with his half-sister Ella in Boston. She was a successful entrepreneur who instilled a sense of black pride in Malcolm. Ella found him a job working shining shoes at the Rolston Ballroom. However, Malcolm was increasingly drawn to the city's criminal activities. And while he took odd jobs and worked as a dishwasher and a sandwich vendor and a waiter on a railroad dining car, his lifestyle quickly escalated into frequenting nightclubs and indulging in crime to support his extravagant lifestyle. 1934, he moved to New York City's Harlem neighborhood. He would acquire the nickname to Detroit Red due to his red hair, and he found employment at the New Haven Railroad, but also engaged in drug dealing, gambling, robbery, and sometimes pimping. He would form a close bond with a man by the name of John Elroy Sanford, who would later be known as Red Fox, but at the time he was known by Chicago Red, while the two were working in Jimmy's Chicken Shack in Harlem. Malcolm would call Fox the funniest dishwasher on earth, and for a while they were partners in crime, stealing suits and reselling them, dealing marijuana and other petty crimes. Red Fox would state that he trusted Malcolm completely. However, agreements arose due to Malcolm's daring criminal activities. In Red Fox's autobiography, he would state that Malcolm didn't have the showbiz talent, so he didn't give a damn about what he got into. He would take on any job to get some dough, and he was a little bit aggressive. I'd rather be sleeping with a broad and go to the club and do 15 minutes of comedy. Malcolm X's lifestyle would eventually catch up to him at the age of 20 in 1946. He and four other accomplices committed a series of burglaries targeting wealthy white families and he was arrested on charges of larceny stolen property was found at his residence linked him to a series of robberies in boston and the new york city area he was swiftly tried and given 10 years in charlestown state prison 
Initially, Malcolm's behavior in prison led him to acquire the nickname of Satan for his habit of pacing around and muttering curses about God and the Bible. He spent most of his early time in prison getting high on nutmeg, smuggling pills and wheat. Then he would intentionally get in trouble to be placed in solitary confinement. Malcolm soon met a fellow convict by the name of John Freebury, a self-educated black man who he would later describe as the first man that I ever saw command complete and total respect with his words. Freebury helped Malcolm develop a voracious appetite for reading. He exchanged his rebellious nature for a more studious one. Driven by his insatiable appetite for knowledge, he would spend long hours in the prison library participating in prison debates, and he would use this thirst for knowledge to make up for being a high school dropout. But his transformation wasn't just academic. During his incarceration, Malcolm encountered the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, who was the leader of the Nation of Islam. Introduced to him by his elder sibling, Reginald, he was captivated by Muhammad's teachings, which prioritized black self-improvement, independence, and ultimately the belief that black Americans needed to establish their own state to achieve freedom, justice, and be free from white America and European domination. This led to Malcolm to reevaluate his views on race relations in America. Malcolm began to correspond with Elijah Muhammad and he found that arguments of Elijah's teaching very compelling and made a decision to convert to Islam. And with that, he dropped the surname Little, which he saw as his slave name and an adopted ex symbolizing his lost African ancestry. Basking in his newfound faith, Malcolm decided to dedicate himself to studying, reading and writing and transforming his prison cell in a, into an intellectual sanctuary. Malcolm's commitment to the Nation of Islam escalated during this period and he would adopt the group's distinct code of personal conduct, dietary prescriptions, and their critiques of Christianity as a tool of subjugation towards African Americans. After serving six and a half years in prison, Malcolm was released from prison in 1952. He quickly visited Elijah Muhammad in Chicago and he would move to Detroit where he was named the assistant minister of the nation's Temple No. 1. In 1954, he expanded Temple Number no. 12 in Philly, and two months later, he was selected to lead Temple Number no. 7 in Harlem, New York. Malcolm rose quickly through the ranks of the organization due to his charisma, intelligence, and powerful articulation of the African American experience. Malcolm X attained a position of prominence within the NOI. He was the minister of temples in Harlem, Boston. He founded new temples in Hartford and Philadelphia and was pivotal in launching the national newspaper Muhammad Speaks to further promote the message of the NOI. As a minister, Malcolm preached that self-determination of African-Americans could only be achieved through separatism rather than integration. He criticized the nonviolent approach of mainstream civil rights movement and passionately advocated against its emphasis on nonviolent integration and its appeal to morality as its main struggle. He was skeptical of the effectiveness of a peaceful protest in achieving the movement's goal. Malcolm firmly believed that blacks should act by any means necessary, including violence, to ensure their freedom, survival, and progress. He saw civil disobedience as a passive approach. Instead, he stated a more aggressive doctrine, arguing that African Americans should protect and advance their rights by all means. Malcolm was also very critical of the leadership of the civil rights movement, especially because most of those leaders were Christian ministers. He felt that they were too willing to compromise and were mostly focused on pleasing their white allies than actually changing the unfair treatment of African Americans. He was particularly critical of Martin Luther King Jr., despite their shared goals for racial despite their shared goals of ending racial discrimination. While King promoted peaceful protests and integration, Malcolm would insist on self-defense. He criticized King's famous I Have a Dream speech, stating that African Americans were living a nightmare, and he disagreed with King's belief that their cause should appeal to the conscience of Americans, arguing that a society that allows racial discrimination has no conscience. However, Malcolm's own beliefs did not escape criticism. His call for racial segregation rather than integration drew a lot of criticism, especially from other members of the civil rights movement. His critics felt that the divisive views encouraged conflict rather than understanding and especially his advocacy for self-reliance. People were also critical of his aggressive message. He often referred to white people as devils and often dismissed 
the peaceful efforts of other civil rights activists as meaningless. This created a view of Malcolm as a person who only sold seeds of bitterness. Lastly, there was a lot of controversy around Malcolm's dedication to the teachings of the Nation of Islam. The group had some very controversial beliefs, including that white people were devils created by a black scientist. Many saw this as racist and against Islamic teachings. He also questioned his loyalty to the group's leader, Elijah Muhammad, even after Muhammad was accused of sexual misconduct. And this raised questions of Malcolm's own morality and his credibility as a civil rights leader. Despite these controversies, his influential speeches and his effective use of media outlets, Malcolm helped dramatically increase the NOI's membership. His efforts led to the growth of the organization from a small group of only a few hundred to an impressive 75,000 by the early 60s. His active promotion of their views and sharp criticism of racial discrimination attracted a significant amount of attention and increased surveillance from the federal government. Beginning in the 50s, the FBI heavily engaged in an operation against radicals of all kinds, but they primarily focused on people that were outspoken against the prevailing political system. Amid this, the counterintelligence program was born, launched by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Understandably, Malcolm found himself on Cointelpro's radar. His criticism of the political establishment, coupled with his letter to President Harry Truman in 1950, where he declared himself a communist and expressed his opposition to the Korean War, made him a figure of interest. Then, his association with the Nation of Islam led to the FBI to start surveilling him in 1953. The FBI's actions against key civil rights leaders, including Malcolm X, would expand beyond their typical scope of surveilling, demonstrating distinct effort to damage his influence. The FBI undertook an active initiative to critique Malcolm X's daily activities, systematically monitoring his public speeches and keeping detailed records of his global travel. To further dampen Malcolm's massive influence, the FBI would start deploying undercover agents into the NOI. Even as the FBI tried to tarnish Malcolm with allegations that he violated the Logan Act, which disallowed citizens from unauthorized engagement with foreign countries, the FBI could not tarnish Malcolm's image due to his steadfast commitment to a law-abiding lifestyle. An FBI informant in 1958 would call him a man of high moral character who neither smoked nor drank and was seldom late for an appointment. One controversial theory suggested the FBI knowingly chose not to thwart a, an assassination attempt against Malcolm. The basis for this hypothesis emanates from the exacerbation that FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had regarding Malcolm's escalating clout. Hoover had an intentional plan to subdue black nationalist movements and, in their own words, prevent the rise of a black messiah capable of rallying African-Americans. This strategy deemed that Malcolm was a imminent threat that needed to be neutralized due to his heightening capability of galvanizing black movements. In an insidious strategy, the FBI used the intelligence that they had gained from their surveillance activities to exploit the differences between Malcolm and the Nation of Islam. The FBI devised a scheme to antagonize Malcolm against Elijah Muhammad through anonymous revelations of Elijah Muhammad's extramarital indiscretions. Despite this underhandedness, it was very efficient, contributing to Malcolm's growing disenchantment with the Nation of Islam. However, this was not the sole cause of their rift. Over time, Malcolm started to question the teachings and the actions of the Nation of Islam, and this caused tensions between him and the group's main leaders. For example, in 1961, conflicts erupted between members of the Nation of Islam and the LAPD. Many Muslims were arrested, but they were later acquitted. But tensions remained high. Two years later, in 1962, two police officers attacked several members outside of Temple No. 27. When a crowd of Muslims came out of the mosque, chaos ensued, leading to one officer being disarmed and the other one being accidentally shot by the first officer. This incident resulted in 70 additional police officers arriving and raiding the mosque, beating members and shooting at least seven people, including William X. Rogers, who was ultimately paralyzed, and Ronald Stokes, who was killed. Despite this event, no charges were ever brought against the LAPD. Malcolm was so angered by the violence, disrespect shown to Muslims and the desecration of their mosque that he proposed violence against the LAPD. But 
This was ultimately rejected by Elijah Muhammad. This denial, along with a second when Malcolm proposed a collaboration with civil rights groups, black politicians, and religious entities, marked a turning point in the relationship between Malcolm and Muhammad. Additionally, December 1st, 1963, Malcolm made a controversial statement about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And he stated, the chickens coming home to roost, implying that the violence against Kennedy was karma for the violence that the government had caused. Malcolm mentions the death of Congolese leader Patrice Lumumba, civil rights leader Megar Evers, and the four black girls who died in the 16th Street church bombing in Birmingham in 1963 as examples of that karma. This caused a lot of backlash. The Nation of Islam initially sent the condolences to the Kennedy family and told their members not to comment on the assassination. They publicly reprimanded Malcolm, but he was allowed to keep his position as minister on the condition that he refrained from speaking for at least 90 days. Shortly after, Malcolm would leave the Nation of Islam and he would establish Muslim Mosque Inc., a religious organization dedicated to the sharing of Islamic teachings with the black community. This was a key step towards his goal of integrating traditional Islamic teachings with black nationalism. He also would co-found the Organization for Afro-American Unity, a group that was dedicated to Pan-Africanism. Around this time, March 26, 1964, he had a very short meeting with Martin Luther King Jr., who previously he had been very critical of. This was possibly their first and only meeting, but it was long enough for photos to be taken. Both men were there to witness the United States Senate's discussion about the Civil Rights Bill at Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. During this time, his own opinions on race and religion began to change. After his famous pilgrimage to Mecca in 1964 profoundly changed him, he witnessed Muslims from different ethnicities and nationalities coming to pray together as equals. And this experience drastically changed his perspective on race relations. And he began to realize that Islam was a universal religion. Malcolm's letters from Mecca revealed the change on his views, writing that the pilgrimage to Mecca forced me to rearrange much of my thought pattern and to toss aside my previous conclusions. He experienced a new vision of unity during his pilgrimage, prompting him to develop a more inclusive attitude towards other races. He would later express that I'm not a racist. I don't believe in any form of segregation or anything like that. I am for brotherhood of man. Interestingly enough, the FBI surveillance did not end after he left the Nation of Islam. They continued to investigate his activities, his ties to civil rights organization, his international travels, and in their surveillance, the FBI tapped his phones and planted informants in the newly formed organizations and sought to disrupt his efforts towards black liberation. Also during 1964, Malcolm faced a lot of threats due to his disagreements with the Nation of Islam. In February, the leader of Temple No. 7 ordered for Malcolm's car to be bombed. In March, Muhammad spoke to Boston minister Louis X, later to become known as Louis Farrakhan, saying that this lower people like Malcolm need to be beheaded. In April, a cartoon was published in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper showing a picture of Malcolm's head being severed. In June, Malcolm's wife, Betty Shabazz, received a phone call where she was told that her husband would soon be dead. Days later, an FBI informant heard that Malcolm was going to be murdered. Later that month, his family was told that they needed to leave the house that they were living in, in Queens. But the house bizarrely was destroyed in a fire the night before a hearing on delaying the eviction could even occur. That July, assistant John Ali warned that anybody that opposed Elijah Muhammad was risking their life. In December, Louis X stated in Muhammad Speaks newspaper that Malcolm deserved to be killed. And lastly, in September of 1964, an Ebony magazine published a photo of Malcolm holding a gun, looking out of the window, showing his determination in the face of these threats. However, February 21st, 1965, while Malcolm was preparing to address the Organization for Afro-American Unity in Manhattan's Audubon Ballroom in Washington Heights, when someone in the 400 person audience yelled, nigga, get your hand out of my pocket. As Malcolm and his bodyguards tried to quell the disturbance, men rushed forth and shot Malcolm once in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Two men then charged the stage, firing semi-automatic weapons. 
Malcolm was pronounced dead at 3.30 p.m. shortly after arriving at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. He was only 39 years old. February 23rd through the 26th, they had a public viewing at Unity's funeral home in Harlem. It was attended by 15,000 to 30,000 mourners. The funeral was held on February 27th. Loudspeakers were set up for the overflowing crowd outside of Harlem's Faith Temple Church of God in Christ. The local television station carried the service live. Among the leaders in attendance were John Lewis, Bayard Rustin, James Foreman, James Farmer, Jesse Gray, Andre Young, and activist and actor Ozzy Davis would deliver the eulogy describing Malcolm as a shining black prince who didn't hesitate to die because he loved us. Within days, the question of who actually bore responsibility for the assassination began to be publicly debated. On February 3rd, James Farmer, who was the leader of the Congress for Racial Equality, announced at a news conference that local drug dealers, not the Nation of Islam, were to blame three individuals, Mujahideen Abdul Harim, Muhammad Aziz, and Khalil Islam, emerged from the audience, and all three men were said to be members of the Nation of Islam. However, controversy quickly arose over their true identities and their affiliations. Others would accuse the NYPD, the FBI, or even the CIA, citing the lack of police protection and the ease at which assailants were able to enter and leave the Audubon Ballroom and the failure of the police to preserve the crime scene. During the 1966 trial, Halim confessed to the crime and insisting that Islam and Aziz were innocent. New York Times reports that there was no physical evidence provided against either Islam or Aziz, and both of them presented credible alibis. Despite the controversy, all three men were convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Doubt was cast on the verdicts of Aziz and Islam for decades. Halim again asserted the innocence of the pair in affidavits in 1977 and in 1978 and offered up partial names of his actual accomplices, but judge denied the motion for a new trial. Calls to reopen the case were left unheard until February of 2020 when Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus R. Vance Jr. began to review the coincidences with the release of the documentary Who Killed Malcolm X that supported the claims of innocence from Aziz and Islam. Also contributing to the controversy was during the 1970s, people found out about Pro. Black journalist Louis Lomax claimed that John Ali, who was the assistant to Elijah Muhammad, was an informant for the FBI. Malcolm once told a journalist that Ali stirred up arguments between him and Elijah Muhammad, and Ali was the biggest enemy of the Nation of Islam. Ali also met with one of the men found guilty of ultimately killing Malcolm X the night before it happened. Malcolm's family would accuse Louis Farrakhan of being a part of the plot to kill Malcolm. In a speech in 1993, Farrakhan stated that the Nation of Islam may have been responsible, stating that was Malcolm a traitor or ours? If he was dealt with like the nation deals with a traitor, what business is of yours? A nation has to be able to deal with its traitors and cutthroats and turncoats. In an interview in 2000, Farrakhan said some things might have contributed to Malcolm's murder. A few days later, he denied that he ordered the assassination, but admitted that he created an atmosphere that ultimately led to Malcolm's assassination. November 18th, 2021, Aziz and Islam were exonerated after the investigation, including the discovery of key FBI documents being withheld from the defense and the prosecution during the trial. Aziz was released from prison in 1985 at the age of 46 after serving 20 years and continues to maintain his innocence. Islam was released in 1985 but died in 2009. Halim was then granted his release in 2010. The missteps in this case highlight the bitter truth and the very discrimination and injustice that Malcolm himself spoke against. He spoke about the deeply ingrained racism within the criminal justice system, and to this day, it's not known who's responsible for the death of Malcolm X. Malcolm X was a trailblazer, a bold speaker during a time when the civil rights movement. His impact was huge and varied, touching not only on black history, but also popular culture and even influencing radical political groups like the Black Panther Party. When you look at Malcolm's life and his work, you truly see how important he was and his teachings helped African-Americans become more aware and conscious of their rights, self-reliance, and love for oneself. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy. This has been One of My Black History.
you like to support the channel, you can do so by buying me coffee on my Patreon page in the description below. Also, I'd like to thank all my new Patreon subscribers. Without you, this would not be possible. And peace. Thank you.